Last time I have already explained the title and what has left to be, um, what is still left to be explained is the word sutra. The word sutra is a Sanskrit word. Um, it means a tallying text. It tallies with the wonderful principles of all the Buddhas and with the opportunities for teaching sentient beings. Um, the sutra is like a garland. The principles are linked together in the sutras like flowers woven into a garland. It's also like the rosary beads. The rosary beads link up all the 108 beads together. It ties it together. So the word sutra means tying together, tying all the principles together and expressed it. That's the meaning of the word sutra. And getting back to the book, um, if you read your book, it's the same. Yeah, okay. If you read the book, it's the same. I put the Chinese side on one side and the, and the Sanskrit translation on the other side. This side is a translation not from the Chinese, it's from the Sanskrit. Um, about 120 years ago. And this side is also translated from Sanskrit that's about 1900 years ago. But the two match. So you can know that we should know that um, it's not a fake sutra. What was discovered, what was translated 1900 years ago uh, is similar to a translation that we have done 120 years ago by a German scholar. So we already have finished, almost finished the first sentence. Let's read it again. Thus it was heard by me at one time the blessed Bhagavad, that is the Buddha, dwelt at Stravasti in the Jatta Grove in the garden of Anatta Pintaka together with a large company of big shoes, mendicant friars, namely with 1250 big shoes, all of them acquainted with the five kinds of knowledge elders, great disciples, and arahats, such as Sariputra, the elder, Maha Madhigalayana, Maha Kazapa, Maha Kafina, Maha Katyayana, Maha Kostila, Revada, Zutipantaka, Nanda Ananda, Rahula, Gavanpati, Bharat Bhaja, Kaladayan, Bakula, and Andrutta. So we finished that, but we haven't explained some of the 16 Arahats. We have finished up to explanation of Rivada. This is a disciple, an Arahat also. Uh, you should know the meaning of Arahat. We have already explained it. Arahat is the enlightened being who is already out from reincarnation, who has achieved Samya Sambuddhi. That's an Arahat. Now, Revada, we already explained. And the next one is Zuti Pan Taka. Now, there's a long story about this Arahat, about this disciple, uh, who I would leave it to the last to explain, because I have something very interesting to show you about Suti Pantaka. Now then, we should explain Landa. Landa means happiness. As a Sanskrit word means happiness, it's the Buddha's brother. His deportment was quite similar to that of the Buddha. It's also called beautiful Nanda. In India, many people uh, still use that name, Nanda. He has almost the same facial features as the Buddha. Next is Alanda meaning joy, alanda, with an A in front, meaning joy, foremost in hearing most of the Buddha's teaching, 25 years personal attendant of the Buddha. Uh, he attended on the Buddha for 25 years, following the Buddha whenever he went, uh, in Sravasti, in Brikadava, everywhere. And alanda has photographic memory. He could remember the content of every congregation, the content of all the Buddha's principles. Rahula, foremost in quietly doing good deeds, son of the Buddha. Gavanpati, 
meaning cow herd, going in arms round in heaven. Now, getting a little bit more details in Nanda. Uh, Nanda meaning, as we said, wholesome bliss. He was a cow herd, tending to the cow, grazing the cow. He attained arahatship. On one occasion, the Buddha instructed Landa to preach to a group of 500 bhikshunis. Bhikshunis are nuns, uh, bhikshunis. Hearing him speak, they all attained arahatship. Sangha community was surprised and they asked the Buddha why. How come Nanda was so effective in preaching to these bhikshunis? The Buddha said, the 500 bhikshunis were the concubines of a king many kalpas ago. Kalpa is millions of years, many, many years, many, many lifetimes ago. These 500 nuns or bhikshunis were the concubines of a king. A king has a lot of concubines in the harem of concubines in the palace. The king was a great dharma protector too, and he built a large pagoda in honor of the Buddha then. The concubines believe in the Buddha and make daily offerings at the pagoda. And they all, the, the, the 500 concubines and the king went to make daily offerings to the pagoda and they all vowed that they would in the future all obtain liberation with the king. All of us will work towards enlightenment, free ourselves from all suffering, and went on to Anutra Samya Samputi, to enlightenment and to be free from all reincarnation. They make that vow. You know, once a vow is made, it becomes very powerful, you know. Whatever the mind can conceive, the mind can do. That's, that's how powerful the mind is. You want to achieve something, and you try it so hard, you make a vow, you plan for it, you, 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 you contribute all your efforts to it, life after life after life after life, finally, you'll be successful. And in this life, in the lifetime of Sakyamuni Buddha, all these concubines, the 500 concubines, became nuns under many, many, many million years later, un, under Sakyamuni Buddha, and they met their king, who is Landa. The king was the former incarnation of Nanda. So the 500 concubines met the king, who they fell in love with many, many cowboys ago, many years ago, and they all make that vow, and they work towards it. Once a vow was made and you tried it, every life you work on it, you'll be successful. And this is the mature lifetime that all these 500 plus one sentient beings became enlightened. So that's the reason why the community, the Sangha community was surprised. So powerful, Landa, how could you, you, you preach to 500 bhikshunis and they all become enlightened to be our heads? And there was a long story behind that. That's the story in brief. That's Landa. So it's very important that you make a vow. It's very important that you make a vow that you become the Buddha that you make a vow that you will be stay away from all these sufferings. You make a vow that you, you start to, to improve on your morality standard, that you start for meditation, then you start to clean up your mind. You make up all these vows for good deeds, you work, you work towards it, and you finally be successful in it. Alanda, the Sanskrit meaning rejoicing, he was the Buddha's cousin, his memory was extremely accurate and long-lasting. He edited and compiled all the, the Buddha sutras and remembered clearly without ever forgetting all the Dharma the Buddha talked about. That's Alanda. Rahula, the son of the Buddha. He worked very hard at his practice. He was foremost in secret practices. He practiced everywhere, whenever he went, whenever the Buddha went, at all times, but he didn't tell anybody. He didn't brag on it. He never advertised that, I am practicing meditation. I am practicing the Buddha's teaching. He never disclosed what he's doing, but he's working very hard at it. He never bragged about what he was doing. He never boasted of his cultivation. So he was very good at that. He was not always telling and cursing and lying. He always kept a very low profile, a very quiet profile, but he worked with a lot of efforts towards it. That's Rahula, the, 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 the Buddha's son. So when the Buddha became the Buddha, 
when the prince Siddhartha Gautama became the Buddha, many of his relatives follow him to become monks and nuns. Even the king, his wife, Yoshidara, Yoshidara became a bhikshuni under the Buddha. Have you heard of the Yoshidara story? Yoshidara had been 500 lives, the wife of Sakyamuni Buddha in previous lives. And there was a long romantic love story in it. And you can, you can always find out more about it. The reason why I want to tell you some stories about these disciples, about these arahats, every one of them had a story to tell. Every one of them have a background. Every one of them have a biography. Like every one of you have a biography. Every one of you have a background. Your background has been very important to you. Uh, what did you do in your background? What did you do in your previous life? What did you do in your yesterday, the day before? All add up to how you are now. If you've done a lot of bad deeds, it all add up. If you do a lot of good deeds, it all add up. It's causality, cause and effect. Every thought counts. Be very careful with your thought. Not just the action, not just the speech. Action and speech is already expressed, a thought expressed. The Buddha said, be very careful with every thought from the mind. It must be a decent, virtuous thought. That's the reason why we meditate. Why do we meditate? It's because we want to relax our body, we want to be healthy. That's just secondary. We want to clean up our mind. We want the control of your mind. And if you say, of course I can control my mind, it's my own mind. If you can control your mind, how come you become mad? How come you curse? How come you yell? How come you become greedy? How come you become jealous? How come all these other people committed criminal crimes? Criminal offenses, why? Because they couldn't control themselves. Now you are when you're meditating. You practice meditation. That's the reason why. Meditation is to get to your mind, not to worship Buddha, not to get God's blessings, no. Your destiny depends on your practice, you yourself, not on God, not on Buddha. The Buddha is only a, a teacher who teaches you how to achieve it. He gives you the map. You gotta travel. You gotta pack up your knapsack and you go. You have to walk. Nobody can walk it out for you. So that's Rahula. Number 12, Pindula Barahvaja, foremost in charity work. He did a lot of charity work. This Arahat, this enlightened being, he was famous in doing a lot of charitable work. Kalodayan, foremost in Dharma propagation. He likes to spread the Dharma. Mahakathina, foremost in astrology and horoscope. Vakula, foremost in longevity, he lived up to 160 years old. Every one of this Arahat had a long story to tell. You can always find out more about it. Why did Vakula live for 160 years old? He had never killed animals for food for 500 lives before. Every one of us we kill animals for food. We support killing animals for food. And he, other than, in addition to not killing animals, he free animals, cage animals. He save animals. For that, he had, he had longevity. Always be blessed with longevity in his deeds. It's causality, cause and effect. Anuruddha, the Buddha's brother, foremost in divine eyesight. How about this Arahat? Aniruddha. He was so lazy when he first became a monk. So the, the Buddha admonished him and said, you, you cannot be lazy, you have to start practicing. So he started to, be, to, to, to work very hard. He worked very hard in reading sutras, in meditation, in doing his practice that he lost his eyesight. He lost completely his eye, couldn't see, he lost his eyesight. But then, 
not very long after he attained arahatship. And when he attained arahatship, when he was in meditation, he could see with divine eyes. In other words, whenever he's in a trance in meditation, he could see galaxies millions of miles away. Other than that, he could see, he could, he could, he has clairvoyance. He has, he has also telepathy. He knows what to think. He had all these supernatural powers. He didn't have the, 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 the flesh and blood eyes, but he had the divine eyesight. He could see through walls. He was blind as far as the, the, the flesh and blood eyes is concerned, but it was all eyesight with divinity. So this Anurutta. I finished all the Arahats, but there's one I want to explain it to you is Zuti Pantaka. Prior to an enlightenment, he is the most foolish of all big shoes, also with extremely poor memory. His gatha later is after he had got enlightened, that's his poem. Sweep clean, guard your speech and mind, control your action against evil doing. Now he had a story so interesting that I leave that last so that now I can explain it to you. Zuti Pantaka his, is a Sanskrit word, and this Sanskrit word means little roadside. What does that mean? He had a brother who is also a monk. His brother, of, of course, attained uh, arahatship also. His mother gave, when his, his mother uh, gave birth to his brother in India in the ancient days, when the woman, when the pregnant woman was ready to give birth to a baby, they had to travel back to their ho own home to give birth to the baby. They didn't give birth to the baby in the husband's home. They have to, they, 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 that's the custom. They travel back to the mother's home to give birth to a baby. And his mother was so busy that he waited till the last minute. So on her way, she gave birth to his brother by the roadside. So his brother's name was the Big Roadside. That's his nickname, the Big Roadside. And then the mother, of course, giving birth, giving birth to him now, the second baby. He was so busy, she was so busy that she forgot again. And along the roadside too. What a coincidence. He didn't, didn't, have, he didn't make it to her home. She gave, she gave birth to, to the second baby on the roadside. So he was also nicknamed the Little Roadside. <laughs> the Little Roadside. Given, born on the roadside. But there's a difference between the Big Roadside and, 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 and the Little Roadside. The Big Roadside was extremely smart and intelligent. And he could learn very fast. Very good memory. So after becoming a monk for about three, four years, he attained arhatship. You know the meaning of arhatship, right? Arhatship, that means all his egoistic mental attitude is all eliminated, no more ego in him. And when he dies out of this body, he does not have to reincarnate into another body. He's always in nirvana, we call it nirvana, enlightenment. We, when we dial out our body, we have to go through another life because we have the karmic energy to pull us to where we, we are going. And that's suffering. We've been suffering life after life like that. But this arahat's already in that, we don't know how to call it, in that bliss, in that purity, in that complete enlightenment that is, they don't have to go through any suffering. That's an arahat. arahat. So his brother attained arahatship within three, four years. So smart. But the little Rosai was just the opposite. Extremely stupid and foolish. They didn't even have good, a memory. So the Buddha Sakamuni instructed some arahats to teach him the little Rosai about a word, you know, a, a, a poem. But he could not even remember two or three words. Some people are like that. They were so poor in their memory that they couldn't remember. You may be amazed. Oh, they, he, some people cannot remember even two, three words. Yes, there are people like that. Some people are autistic. 
Some people have different level of oxygenism. It happened that way. So he didn't, couldn't remember even three, four words. So he couldn't learn. And at, at a certain time, the big roadside was not completely enlightened uh, yet, not became the Arahat. And he got quite, he got quite uh, um, disgusted with, with his brother. Because look, he, th he thought to himself, we left home. Our parents are still plowing the land, they are peasants plowing the land. Nobody look after our parents. Now, both of us be uh, became monk under the, under the Buddha. Who is going to look after our parents? So he talked to little Rosai and he said, little Rosai, you got no hope. I mean, you better go home. Well, I don't want you to be here because look, you're not, you're not making any progress at all. You're not learning anything. So why don't you go back home and look after our parents so that I can practice peace peacefully. Now I, I'm always thinking my, about my parents. I, I really, I, I, I feel sorry about our parents um, losing two sons. We should, we should be looking after them. Now, can you go back home, little Rosai, and look after them so that I can practice peacefully? Little Rosai did not want to go home. So he was so sorrowful that he was being scolded by his brother and he was crying and weeping uh, at the entrance of the monastery. The Buddha saw it and the Buddha said, what happened to you, little roadside? Little roadside told the whole story about being pushed to go back to, to look after his parents. And the Buddha said, don't worry about it. Um, who said that you cannot practice? Let me teach you two words. Can you remember two words? I don't know, I try. Just two words. Sweep clean. Sweep clean. Using a broom, using a broom to sweep the floor clean. Can you remember these two words? And combine with these two words, you do that action. Now you, not, you don't have to read any sutras. You don't have to, to read any, any literature. You don't have to read any words, just remember, remember sweep, sweep clean, and you're sweeping, you're brooming the floor for the monastery. Every day you are, you are sweeping clean all the land in the monastery, inside and out. That's your chore. Can you do that? Yes, I can. Yes. And if you forget, you know you're sweeping clean. Your action remind your words, and your words remind your action. You sweep clean. Every time when you say, sweep clean, sweep clean, then you're doing the action, then you'll remember it. So little Rosai tried to remember these two words. It was difficult at first, but he was doing this action that reminds him, sweep clean or broom clean. And after a few years, one day, he was brooming inside the meditation hall. And in the morning, it was quite dark. It was a cloudy day. And all of a sudden, after brooming for a while, the sun broke out and the sunlight shines into the room and it brightens up the room. And he saw the dust flowing in the air. He couldn't see the dust with his naked eyes because it was so dark and gloomy. And all of a sudden, there was a, a, a breakthrough of the sunlight and, and shine through into the room. And he saw this dust flowing in in the air, and all of a sudden, because of this incident, he got enlightened. And he said, oh, am I sweeping the floor, or I'm sweeping my mind? The floor is dirty, I sweep it off, but even the air has dirt in it. I didn't, I didn't notice the air has dirt in it. I, be, I should be sweeping clean everything, not just the, the ground, not just the floor. What do I have to sweep? How about my mind? What am I doing? Now I'm thinking, I'm seeing all these things. What do I see these things with? Not just with the eyes, but with my thought behind it. So I should be sweeping my thought, thought my mind. So it's not just not sweep clean, it should be sweep mind clean. So he started to meditate. I sweep my mind clean. I broom my mind clean. I broom up all the dust from my mind. No more dust from my mind. 